so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my seminar. Uh, today's uh, speaker is Aaron Sulman. Uh, Aaron is doing a, a postdoc uh, here at Tupper with uh, Satin Kati, and he did his PhD back in, in Maryland, uh, where uh, his thesis was on observing and improving the reliability of last mile connections. And this includes different technologies, Wi-Fi, cellular, uh, and residential links. And today's talk is going to be one part of this, which is how weather affects uh, residential links. And this is the recently awarded the SICOM uh, dissertation award. Uh, Luis, congratulations. And, uh, Thanks a lot. So uh, I'm going to talk about what I thought at the time was like a really simple, basic question, which is how does weather affect residential internet connections? And uh, what I'm going to show you is that it turns out answering that question involves quite a lot of work. And some of that is actually just building an infrastructure to observe when residential links fail. And uh, it turns out that's even useful for more things than weather. Um, but in the end, I mean, it's, it's a lot to pick up. And you'll see that the actual weather results at the end make up only a small part of the, the, uh, the study itself. But let, let's dive on in. So, uh, OK. so. We know that weather affects residential links intuitively. You know, lightning tends to strike antennas, and uh, water actually can seep into telephone lines as well as coaxial cable. This is a well-known phenomenon that's recorded back to the early 1900s, and that's why we actually pressurize some of our telephone cables. And uh, finally, you know, of course, wind uh, can snap trees and uh, can also cause stress on wires. So. Uh, why do we care about this? Well, it turns out that, you know, customers, when they want to make choices of what provider they need in their area, uh, this is actually a reasonably important thing as we, as we move along to uh, having TV and other uh, services sent over our last mile internet connections. Uh, if they live in an area where they're prone to something like freezing rain, you would want to know that a particular link type or a particular provider in that area is not so, doesn't do so well when there's freezing rain, and also how long it would take to repair it in freezing rain. Um, and also for the providers, we want to inform them what their, uh, what their problems are. We want to actually measure across all providers and say, hey guys, there are these little mini natural disasters going on all the time, like it's a little bit of wind, a little bit of rain. When an eventual larger natural disaster goes on, like here's uh, the links that you should be worried about, essentially. Uh, and maybe you can solve those ahead of time or fix those ahead of time. Well, in order to answer the question uh, of, you know, how does... It, so these are examples, by the way, of questions that you would want to ask. Uh, how does weather affect residential links? Like, are, are these new fiber deployments more robust to something like wind? Uh, does rain, not th thunderstorms, but rain itself, does it correlate with the... Uh, with internet outages. And uh, are these extreme temperatures that we've seen, are they correlating with failure rates? And how do they correlate with failure rates? And the tough thing is, to answer these kind of questions, you need to observe huge swaths of locations. Like, you need to observe different weather in different locations. There's more snow than there is in North Dakota than California. You also need to observe lots of link types. You can't just say, you know, it's not very interesting if you only look at DSL. You want to look at DSL versus cable versus fiber versus wireless internet service providers. So we need to get a lot of data. And that was the first challenge in this work. And also, one, one of the other reasons we need a lot of data is that's, I kind of think that each residential deployment is like a, a pretty unique little butterfly. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, but when I'm walking down the street, I spend most of my time looking up at telephone poles and looking down <laughs> at the infrastructure to see, like, in, in this area, what kind of infrastructure do, they, do we have? And here's an example of some photos I took when I was walking when I was in Maryland. Um, this is a Comcast deployment, and uh, so basically in the head end or in the main Comcast building, you have this CMTS, which has a fiber link which goes out to this, which is the node. And it's kind of hard to see the fiber link. It's one of the thinner cables that goes into this. And then the node does a media conversion from fiber to coaxial. And then there are all these splitters hanging off of it, which look like they're really like well thought out and what splitters need to be thought out at all. And then uh, eventually that splits off and goes to a few amplifiers, 
if necessary, and then eventually into a final set of splitters that split off into the actual homes. And you know, if you look across cable deployments, if you look across DSL, et cetera, the infrastructure is different. It's different brands, it's deployed in different ways. There's different splitters with different ages, though cables are new and old, and some of them it looks like they're completely falling apart that I've seen here actually in uh, Menlo Park. So uh, this, just looking at one location's cable deployment is not useful. We need to look at sort of the broad cable deployments in the United States or wherever we're observing to answer how does weather affect it. So here's our approach. Well, we sort of view weather like this really natural experiment, which it is. That basically when the weather rolls in, A, you have a forecast of it, which is really nice. So you say, ah, oh, here comes the weather. Uh, I'm going to start looking at these residential links in this area where the weather is. So I'll look at a different, bunch of different providers, Comcast, RCN, whoever's there, uh, Verizon. And I'm, since I want to look across all these different link types, I can't use one uh, probing technique that only works on fiber, or only works on cable, only works on wireless. I need a universal type of uh, measurement tool. So I just use ICMP pings, and uh, we'll see that that creates a lot of headaches. Uh, but it's, I think, the best tool for, for observing you know, whether links are failing or not across many different types. Uh, again, there's a lot of links out there, and not all of them are experiencing weather. And so I wanted to be careful with my resources. I want to make sure that when I'm probing something, that that link is, has some chance of experiencing weather. I don't want to waste my resources probing other links that won't experience weather. And finally, uh, I'm going to look at those ping losses, and I'm going to look for abnormal sequences in the ping losses. And those I'm going to interpret as failures, and I'll tell you how that works. So here's the general flow of the uh, actual analysis collection of data. So we start out with a ton of data. Ooh, I have a little pointer. We start out with a ton of data here when we're pinging the links, and that's why we have a big arrow. And then uh, we filter out broken vantage points, because it turns out even the vantage points can be a source of errors. Uh, now our arrow gets a little bit smaller. Then we try to identify, we take those pings and try to reduce them down to states. What is the state of this link right now? Is it up? Is it down? Uh, first, we do that by finding downs. Then we pull out ups and this weird thing called host, which is the source of about a one and a half year headache, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, then finally, we add these together to find failures. When you have a up to down transition, there's a failure. Uh, yeah. Okay, so how, how, how do you think the links? Are you referring to the uh, interface that are connected to? Because it could be a link down or it could be a port, right? Or uh, so we are... are interactive, but maybe you can kind of play that. Sure, uh, you mean a port at the head end or a port no, actually? I mean, the link is connected to something, right? Like sure. So that's so that's what we're talking yeah. about your probes and how they work. Yeah, so we're probing from different vantage points. So at least we're trying to isolate that the last mile link would be the source of the failure, but certainly it could have been uh, for instance, if there's a power outage, uh, then your router goes out. Okay, so does your cable modem, but you know your router goes out in that instance. Pretend just your router ran out. Sure, that could actually be a source of uh, noise in our data. <coughs> if just the thing that's connected to your last mile link failed. But we're probing so many links, the hope is that you know that sort of noise ends up being noise and not a <coughs> source of signal. Yeah. So maybe I ask the question, same question, different way. Is the only thing you're pinging, the actual IP address, a CPE router, or do you have access to the ICMP stacks of the intermediate nodes, whether they're oh, no, IP? No, no, no. Yeah, no. I love You're that only that's... doing CPE. I'm and... only doing CPE. I and you infer that. from there. Okay. Sorry? And you infer from there. I infer there's... from there. Again, I use multiple vantage points to try to minimize the uh, effect of sure. some other links on the internet being broken. But again, I want to do this across many vantage points, many locations. So in order, sorry, many locations, many weather types and link types. In order to do that, I need to do something that doesn't use proprietary data, that doesn't give me, although I'd love to have access to Comcast stats on the intermediate routers. That would, actually for validation, that would be very cool, but I'd like to talk to them about how I could maybe make some of that data public. I'm sort of a big, uh, it's hard for me to do studies where I can't make the, the, the data public. So I'd have to figure out a way to work that out with them. But anyway, all right, so then finally, power outages could of course be a source of failures and we want to look for network outages. So I try to remove them and then I'll give you a short explanation of how we do that. And then finally, we get a correlate with weather. <laughs> Took all of that. What a pain. All right, yes? Does weather often cause power outages? 
Yeah, it does. So that's and both local and I mean at multiple scales, mm -hmm. right? Like one, it can cause your your power over Ethernet to fail, right? and uh, you know, two is you know and, and from anywhere to your endpoint all the way up. Right. So we filter power outages. We're trying to filter power outages that are more like reasonably large scale, like a neighborhood or an entire uh, metropolitan area. Those are the ones that we filter out, but. Uh, you know, a very local outage where just one person's home is affected by, uh, their power is affected by some weather, I mean, that's, it could again be a source of noise in the data, but I, I think that that generally would be much lower probability than uh, other effects of weather. Alright, so, let's start with how we do the probing. So, uh, NOAA, the National Weather Service, has this really cool feed of all the weather alerts in the United States. It's a nice little RSS feed. And what it includes, this is an example of one of the alerts. One of uh, the fields that we care about are, when is this alert effective? Uh, when does it expire? And for what geocode, what area does this alert cover? And uh, again, what's really nice about this is these are coming ahead of the actual weather itself. So we have a nice little forecast, and we can direct our pings into that area based on these forecasts. So the, yeah. other day, the other day, I looked at my iPhone, and it said that the weather is going to be completely clear all day. Yeah. yeah, it rained all day. Do you, do, you, do you actually validate that the weather that you predicted actually occurred? Big time, yeah. And so we don't trust, we use this to aim our pings. Is we it? use a completely different data set yeah. on the, what was the on the ground weather afterwards. Because sure enough, yeah, I mean, the forecast or the alert has potentially nothing to do with what happens in real time. So yeah, I'll explain that uh, in a moment. So uh, <coughs> now another question is how do we find all these residential links to ping? Well, we did a nice targeted reverse DNS scan of the internet, where we start by scanning all the slash 24s, and we try to find at least one IP that has a, uh, a domain name for a known residential provider. Then uh, we do some filtering, where we have a sort of reasonably sized set of common host names that would be used for residential links. Things like pool is part of the DCP pool, or something like a DSL, the actual link type of the name. And we filter out you know, all those routers and other things that are uh, IPs that belong to residential providers. Then, uh, so then the question is, well, how do we, uh, by the way, we found 100 million IPs doing that. So the question is, how do we then figure out where those IPs are located? And this is something that I'd like to improve, but for right now, it's kind of tough. I need to know ahead of time where the IPs are, hundreds of millions of IPs. How do I do that? I have to use something like a database of IP geolocation. I'd ideally like to use some IP geolocation technique where I can, on each of those IP, try to figure out where it's located. Uh, but again, when the alert comes in, I need the set of IPs that I'm going to probe right then and there. So I use MaxMind geolocation database. It could be better, but I think red, uh, weather is sort of a regional phenomenon. So if it's even if there is some inaccuracy in MaxMind, it still should give us a reasonable estimate of where these IPs are. So, yeah. this, for example, my Comcast IP shifts. Sometimes it tells me I'm in their Chicago block, sure. you know, et cetera. And I'm like, that's weird. So there's some, <laughs> problem, there's some problems with MaxMind. And actually, one of them is that, uh, so for a particular IP, when you do the reverse DNS name, you actually sometimes get two different reverse names for the same IP. Uh, and I don't believe that, so we actually do try to make sure that, and those for constant, Comcast, uh, for instance, it'll say like California and Maryland dot this IP dot this IP, okay? So we do try to make sure that when there are some of these like duplicate names, for instance, that maybe messed up MaxMind when they did their reverse DNS probe to guess where things are located, we try to correct for that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it is a, uh, it is possibly a source of error, just that MaxMind is not perfect. But we believe that it, it is somewhat reasonable to do this stuff. Okay. So uh, we do sampling. Whenever a weather alert comes in, uh, we, only we only probe 100 IPs from each link type and provider in that area. So again, Verizon can have five and DSL. We make sure we're probing uh, 100 IPs from each. And finally, uh, in order to find the provider and link type, the way we do that simply is we just take the numbers out of the reverse DNS name. And what you end up with is usually this unique provider and link type name. Like here, we have DSL and Verizon. So. Uh, that tends to work pretty well, and we've done uh, some checking in our data to make sure that it does. So, all right, the final thing we do in the probing is the actual pinging itself. How do we do that? Well, again, I believe one vantage point is not enough. We're looking at the last mile link, and in order to make sure or hope 
or making sure that the last mile link is actually what's breaking, uh, we send from 10 vantage points. And we use Planet Lab just because those are uh, available and also widely deployed. Uh, we also ping infrequently. And I've done a lot of internet measurement studies and I've gotten a lot of complaint reports. What's really cool about the pinging infrequently part of this is that over three years I've been pinging, I haven't had a single complaint report. Uh, which is a really big deal for for me at least because they can get pretty hairy sometimes and then Planet Lab can start blaming you for causing all this. I mean, it can get really ugly. But this has been running for three years and we're not seeing any, uh, no problems. <laughs> uh, and we stole that number 11 minutes from John Hyden. He'd use it for another study so he didn't get complaint reports for for us too. Uh, also, uh, we want to omit uh, needless pings. So basically, if there's an IP when the weather comes in and we're probing it, and it's not up right then when the weather's probing it, we drop it. And we try to only focus on those IPs where the weather is actually, where it's alive when the weather is coming in. And finally, we know that pings, of course, have different reasons why they could be lost. So we, in our probing, actually do some extra work where when a ping is sent and it comes back, and then immediately after that, if we send another ping and it doesn't come back, we retry with the exponential back off the ping from each of our vantage points. And that just gives us more data to see if that ping is actually a real failure or not. Indicates a real failure or not. So, the data set we have, 4 billion pings, uh, over 3.5 million IPs, and 400 days of data. This, again, uh, is not three full years that I've been working on it because we've had to take it offline to fix uh, some bugs here and there, but that is the data set. And I'm the kind of person that uh, I believe it's tough to fully understand a data set without looking at it. So I'd like to make giant visualizations of my data sets. So again, we're only probing the United States for this study. And here what you're seeing, each one of the blue dots, and I'll, I'll start animating this in a second. Each one of the blue dots is one of the hosts, and they're uh, transparent. So basically, if there are a lot of hosts in one area, it'll show brighter. If there are fewer, it'll show dimmer. And I'm going to show you the month of December. So as you can see, here's our thunder ping, is the, that's the name of the prober. It's adaptively as it sees different weather conditions from the uh, NOAA feed. It's going and it's picking different areas and it's pinging them. And by the way, when you see the red show up, that is indica indicative of just a basic metric where more than half of the vantage points reported that the host isn't alive. And there's some really crazy stuff that happens. I think, I don't know if it already happened, up in Minnesota, you might see it in a moment. Did it already have the big explosion of lots of downs? Yeah. yeah. So there was a really bad snowstorm that day, and that's an example of a power outage in this data. Usually when you see the giant flashes, those are the power outages in the data. They ran cold in California around that time. Well, it was cold in California around that time? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So it's... December was actually kind of a particularly interesting time to study. And at the bottom, you're seeing the fractions of, this is percentage of hosts in that state that were up, and then this is the number of hosts we're pinging. So, you know, we're pinging thousands of hosts in each state at any time on any day, really. So, okay, so that's the basic idea. Uh, cool. So I'm gonna start out uh, by just giving a short overview of how we filter these pings. And I'm not going to focus too much on down, because down normally looks uh, kind of like this. <laughs> you have all your 10 vantage points, that's what's on the y-axis. This is a Comcast host that I was pinging. Uh, and on the x-axis, sure, you see that you know, a few pings are dropped, uh, but generally when there's down, as there should be, all the vantage points stop seeing pings coming back. And by the way, you can see our little retransmissions that go on there from each of the vantage point. Um, Again, we do exponential back off to make sure we're not arguing too much. And then uh, we see it comes back alive at some point. So this is a, uh, a down. It's pretty easy to find. I can explain later on if, you, if you're is interested. It's like an actual graph. So you, you, so you claim that the links come out after uh, seven hours or something? Yeah, that's right. No, this is from our data set, straight eight from hours. the data set. Okay. Yeah. So um, you guys have it out at eight hours? Yeah, this was, I believe, during, uh, this might have been during one of the tornadoes in 2011, so I think it was a prolonged <laughs> outage from there. Um, just makes for pretty data, but, uh, excuse me, generally it's, uh, you're just wondering why it's a seven hour outage. That's no, only that everything comes out at almost the same time. That's well, I mean, again, uh, this, is this the same, <laughs> the same link that you're probing from 10 yeah, what is it? No, no, sorry, yeah, yeah, I saw this. I, I should clarify. This is one link that I'm probing from 10 vantage points, so that's why they all. Up at the same time. 
So the red dot in the previous slide was outage? Sorry, the red dot, was it outage when, when there was a red dot? That yeah, 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 red dot indicates that from those vantage points, a majority of them indicated that it's not alive at that point. Okay, yes. and do you have like a measure for uh, quality degradation rather than just outage? That's yeah, so we're, we're getting to that in a second. That's where it starts to get hairy. So this is the easy thing to deal with. I can find these down periods somewhat easily. And where it gets complicated is this other behavior we observe, which we call host. And that's sort of what you're saying, which is like a quality degradation of some sort. What does host look like? Uh, so host kind of looks like this. It's really strange. And I've seen this a lot, and it, it's very not intuitive for me to explain. So we have it up, the host is up. Again, we're pinging one host from 10 vantage points here. They generally look like this. The host is up. Then all of a sudden, there's a bunch of lost pings. And then you go into this weird sort of, uh, there's some lost probability for each ping. And again, all of a sudden, it kind of comes back up again. And then all the pings are coming back. Yeah, you often see that like with congestion. So, but you don't see a change in RTT. And here's an example. So the color that's shown on the y-axis is the RTT, and you see that the RTTs don't change. I mean, if the, if the buffers are small, the RTT won't change. So that, that is one instance of what, what could be a source of the problem. But as we'll find out later on, this actually correlates quite nicely with weather. And depending on different link types, correlates in different ways. And I even have done controlled studies at home where I hooked up attenuators to my cable motor to try to figure out what could be a source of this. Uh, and it turns out there is a reasonable explanation for it that I'll get to at the end. Um, yeah? For some lakes, like for DSL, there will be any pain. Like there a retransmission, you're saying? Yeah, so the, the modem will lose uh, synchronization. Yes. If the replay does an outage, let's say 30 seconds. Yes. And they have to come back on. Right. So, I mean, if that was the case, that could be a source of this, for sure. If you have degraded signal quality and then your modem is having to reconnect all the time, yeah, that could be an example of what would cause this, for sure. Um, and that's fine. To me, you know, if there's a degradation in signal quality in the link because of weather and that you end up with this, that's totally reasonable to me. And it seems like it could happen. And that's actually, we'll talk about that. And it sort of answers this question too, and I'll get to why I think that happens and what our assumptions are about last mile connectivity that we might need to change. And we are already changing. Yeah. It could also be the um, link layer. After you've lost, I mean, these broadband aggregation boxes that do yeah. the PPP uh, sessions, sometimes they have tens of thousands of endpoints on one big red box style or Cisco style sure. box that if they all get hammered at the same time, they go hammer radius to, to reestablish the link layer. I don't know, I, I don't yeah, know about an hour. It's on the scale of an hour and then yeah. with probes that are coming every few minutes. I mean, that that is... Yeah. It, it might be the case, but I think these longer term, these are not short term failures, yeah, they're yeah. really long term failures. So. It's just that if, the, if the phi and, and link layer has its own form of exponential back off after failures, and that so does the PPP layer, all these are unseen by IP. Right. They're I underneath. Mean, I don't know about an hour, though, you're right. I yeah. would expect yeah. the duration of that would be yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so how do we, the tough thing was actually trying to find those states in our data set and isolate them. And it turns out this kind of makes sense why it's tough, because there isn't really a particular loss rate that happens. In fact, in one sort of period of this posed phenomenon, the loss rate can change by quite a bit. Like what you're seeing here, again, uh, this is for another host from our data set. We have uh, the vantage points on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have time. And we see it's a bit tough to see these x's, I apologize. But we see that you know there for each vantage point at different times there are these losses and then eventually a nice little recovery at the end. And what I'm plotting up at the top here, uh, this is the smooth uh, loss rate that that vantage point is experiencing, or that this host is experiencing. And we see again that there's all these different bumps in it. And uh, so how do we do this? Well. Honestly, it took over two years to come up with the answer to this question. And there has been some previous work on this, but it was never involving ping data. It was always involving, so they have this concept in, in previous work of these transition periods of network activity, where basically uh, you're getting, let's say, the same throughput, then all of a sudden you're getting a different throughput, then in the end you're getting the same throughput. And when you have well, one number metric like throughput, you can sort of 
uh, find these transition periods using techniques that they came up with. But we don't really have a one number metric here. We're actually looking at you know, all these different vantage points and we have to figure out what the loss rate is somehow. Um, and even coming up with that loss rate is unclear how you should do that. Do you do it over a big window, a little window, etc. So what I figured out is that this is actually really similar to edge detection in, uh, in uh, whatever, computer vision, I apologize. So essentially, if you think of sort of these different things as pixels, and uh, when you get to the point where there are some losses, it's kind of like finding the edges in a noisy image, okay? And so we can apply, actually, the sort of most famous edge detection algorithm, uh, which I believe, can you edge detection? I never know how to pronounce it, but I believe that's what it's called. And what you do is, it's pretty basic, you apply uh, this Gaussian um, smoothing on the actual ping data, where we assume each ping, as if the ping came back, it's a one, it's a zero, it's a loss. And that's what you get in the top white line, you have that smooth uh, ping data. And then, you find the first derivative of it, and you look for the peaks, or the maximums in the first derivative. Pretty straightforward. And what you see is really nice. We find that, you know, right here is exactly the point where that first ping was lost, and we have this huge inflection point there. Uh, and then also at the end, we have a nice inflection point uh, in the derivative, a uh, nice maximum there, which indicates the end. So, uh, also in the middle, there are different changes in the failure rate, and we also identify those, but what we, we do is, uh, if we see an up interval, and then a host interval, and then a host, and a host, and a host, we just group those together as well. All right, so that was host. Host is a huge pain, and I, I go ahead. Yeah. How much lag from the where the host event ends do you need in order to be able to detect it? So, you know, you wouldn't know whether the the time period there you got the eleven minute interval, what it went two intervals and went bad again, but that's in your data set. Are you saying if it was like a real time? How about in real time? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, the question. If I wanted to do a real time, I would probably have to use either this technique with uh, a much skinnier smoothing to make sure that I'm finding those really fine intervals where something may have happened, um, or a completely different technique. This is an offline technique, and you're right. For what I would do, though, for uh, probably, if, again, one of the plans with this study is actually to have the data in some real-time interface, probably with a lag of, let's say, an hour or so, uh, posted online. That's what I would do. I would just add some lag, and, and I think it's still useful even if you had that lag. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, real time would not be so clearly easy to do with this thing. How do you determine that threshold line? Yeah, so the threshold line is determined uh, just by collecting a lot of the data and seeing what what makes a reasonable threshold line for finding the host. There isn't really a, a medical technique for doing it. It's totally empirical, yeah. Yeah, it's not, um, we're not able to, I mean, it. it's basically, because uh, that would determine also the frequency yeah, yeah, that's true. So I, I, I don't talk about it here, so what we also apply, at the same time as we apply this, uh, so I, it's only a little number here, but sigma six, that is the Gaussian uh, sort of filtering that we're, the Gaussian smoothing that we're applying. We also apply a much wider smoothing at the same time. And this is actually drawn from previous work. They did something similar, where basically you try to find the sort of quick changes and also the long period of time changes in, uh, and when you, you com combine those two, and essentially you will find then the, uh, you'll be able to filter out some of the shorter period of time changes that don't actually result in a longer period of time changes. So what kind of observations do you get from that? I mean, what kind of have your... Like how does it help to have the long period yeah, of time? Yeah, I mean, identify those uh, uh, peaks, you know, that doesn't have your... Oh, it's, it's important to us because essentially this, we believe... Okay. Well, we believe that this could be caused by weather, the host, these host intervals. And that essentially it could be a result of a degradation in, in signal quality on the link. Um, and honestly, we didn't expect this. We thought that it was going to be like kind of general internet loss that would be going on, and then if there was an interval like this, it would be associated with really high RTTs. And that actually wasn't the case. Uh, yeah. Did you correlate this with actual the weather, what happened in the weather? Uh, yeah, I did. I'm going to get to that at the end. So. And then the follow-up question is that if you know what kind of weather is it rain, is it, uh, you know, spice or... Yeah, we, you know, or we split it up by weather, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so, 
and that's what I'm going to get to right now. <laughs> so uh, I'm, just to give you a quick idea of what we do to remove outages, it turns out the government maintains this list, or power outages, the government maintains this list of power outages that are self-reported by the power companies. And what we did is correlate that list with our up to down failures. And what we, we have this hypothesis, and, and this is our assumption, is essentially if you have more than one IP from more than one provider that fail at approximately the same time, that that is likely to be a power outage, whereas uh, if you only have one provider that's failing or only one IP that's failing, that's likely not to be a power outage. And we correlated with, these, uh, with this power outage data, and we said, we observed that for two IPs, when you have an IP uh, from two different providers that failed at approximately the same time, that's very likely to be during one of these known power outages. So that's our threshold. If the interval, if the down interval comes at the point when there were two IPs from two different providers in that location that failed, then we knock it out from our data set. This is pretty, uh, it's removing a lot of data from the data set. Oh, that's interesting, because I would have almost thought that, it, that that would, that doing the opposite would be a good idea. That, that, oh, really? Which is that if you have, uh, you know, the idea is if you have, if just Comcast fails, well, maybe Comcast is messed up, right? Mm -hmm. But if but if you know Comcast and some other ISP, well you know, and so if you have sort of multiple ISPs, then it's less likely to be a problem just with the one ISP due to configuration or overloading their aggregation point. Sure. Or, you know, basically the problems that I always get when I call Comcast and they just flip some switch that oh we forgot to flip the make it work switch. So. <laughs> sure, sure. So I mean, it's uh, again, I think there's a big diversity of how these links are deployed. And you know, even in one area, you have some links that are undergrounded fiber links. You have some links that are on the telephone poles uh, and different equipment. And it, to me, it doesn't seem likely that you would have these correlated failures unless there's a correlated source of the failure in terms of some property that they both share, some uh, resource they both share. And to me, I see that as power. So if you have like multiple wireless ISPs, for example, they're, yeah. they're all sharing the air. If you have, yeah, but they don't have a place where you have. Uh, you know, where you actually have an open cable or DSL market and multiple providers, you know, same sort of thing. If you have people that are sharing the same conduit, which is also common as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, sharing of, the same conduit, of, yeah, sharing, right? sharing the same conduit, I, I, I totally agree with you about. The wireless thing, I actually don't agree with. It turns out, and I know, I've sort of worked with these wireless internet service providers a lot, they kind of cut their territory up from each other, because mm -hmm. they're usually using unlicensed spectrum, so it's unlikely that you'll have one that's provided by more than one. It does, it's not that it doesn't happen, but it is generally. Well, I, mean, I, I mean, on my iPhone, I'm, you know, I, 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 there are what, at least five wireless. Oh, I'm not probing cellular links in this. Oh, okay, sorry. I was going to say, you know, if you look at your Wi-Fi, you can see, you know, I see, a, you see like at and I see Comcast, I see, you know, I see, I see Starbucks, if you look at cellular as well, so I mean, that's true, but I, I'm probing the residential link. So I'm probing mostly wired links as well as like fixed point-to-point -point wireless ISPs. So I'd be probing the router that serves that at and host, not your iPhone that's actually seeing all of it. Makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it is the case that there could be conduit that they're sharing where you have a correlated bit. That definitely is true. I think that that's... I think there's also shared sure, sure infrastructure, at least in certain places that where they haven't banned it. Uh, in last mile, yeah, I mean, there's, for instance, you have the, like, CLAC, where you have a telephone company that has a lot of DSL companies that are providing from the same infrastructure, sure, yeah, exactly. that's a new example of something yeah. that we're going to have. And I'm assuming somehow you also figure out any network uh, disconnects, right? Uh, you, you lose connection because the provider, you know, has some issues, which is not weather related. Uh, so it is... Or somebody disconnects because they want to move to another provider, right? So we we sort of we try to treat that as noise because it's yeah. it's very difficult it for us to control right. for something like that. The assumption is that would happen across link types across providers, and so that should affect sort of all of our data and across weather conditions right. as well. Uh, Can we defer questions until you want? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm always thinking of you guys. So, all right. That's weird. Do you see the screen shaking? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Weird. <laughs> Someone look on Twitter on the earthquake bot. <laughs> All right. So uh, okay. The 
now to answer your question from the beginning, uh, we use this uh, data, forecast data from NOAA in order to figure out when we probe. But actually figuring out what the weather was at the time when we were probing, we use airport weather stations. Uh, this is a picture of an airport weather station. This is called an ASOS station. And it, I honestly, at the beginning of this, didn't quite understand where our weather measurements truly came from. But this is one of certainly the primary sources for things like what type of precipitation uh, how much cloud coverage, etc. Uh, this thing is my favorite measurement device, the precipitation identifier. It has a, basically a light that's shining into some sort of sensor, it's like a camera, and it can figure out you know, what's falling between these two sensors. That's how it figures out if it's snow, if it's rain, etc. Very cool. I think that's a really cool probe. Uh, visibility is also kind of, I mean, it's not important or anything, but I also think it's a cool. Uh, a cool little toy, it just sort of has a laser and then it checks to see what the reflection is off of what's in there. Pretty cool. Anyway, uh, so we have all these real actual measurement devices and they spit out these things. And if anyone in here is a pilot, uh, they may be familiar with METAR or METAR, whatever people call it. These are the sort of hourly weather reports that come from these weather stations. Uh, here's an example uh, of an area, I think this was Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, and essentially, over time, each of these weather reports, we see that it went from clear to scattered clouds to haze to thunderstorms, and then eventually to have a heavy thunderstorm. So these automated weather reporting stations are the source of our ground truth data. And if you want to take a look at kind of generally where these are deployed, this is a view on the East Coast. Uh, this is when Hurricane, I, don't know, I think it was Irene, uh, was coming up the East Coast, and I just plotted like a general concept of what the weather was. So you can see that, you know, as it was coming up into the general Maryland, New York area, we had a lot of rain in those areas. And yet, yeah, each one of these diamonds is where one of those airports are that we're getting our data from. So, uh, I mean, this is sort of the reality of weather data. It's not actually, there are other data sets like Weather Underground, but I wanted to be really careful to only use this like curated sensor pool. And these airport weather stations are maintained by NOAA, and they really want to make sure they're operating properly. Some of them, some of these airports even have weather sort of like operators that are maintaining that station and making sure it's working at all times. Because if it breaks, you know, planes have trouble landing. <laughs> so it's good data, that's for sure. Um, all right, so finally, let's look at some weather results. Okay, so uh, let's look at wind, first of all. So this plot, and I apologize for what happened with this satellite, uh, guys that we're probing here, it's a little bit difficult to see. But uh, on the left-hand side, we're looking at failures where we go from up to down. The right-hand side, we're looking at failures where we go up to hose. And we have the different link types that are shown with the different uh, glyphs. And you can see, uh, what we're looking at, by the way, is wind speed versus probability of failure within an hour. So if you're looking at one IP, uh, in an hour, what's the probability that it will fail in that hour? And there are a few really cool things here. First of all, if you look at up to down failures, the relationship between wind speed and the failure rate is this nice non-linear relationship. And that actually makes sense. And at least, you know, all data makes sense. You can come with, up, up with some explanations, right? But here's my explanation. Uh, the drag, basically the relationship between wind speed and drag is a quadratic relationship. So it's not entirely too surprising to imagine that, you know, if you have, let's say, uh, telecommunication lines that are sort of being brought, dragged by the wind, that the higher the wind speed, uh, it would have a quadratic relationship with the, uh, with the actual failure rate. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And that, of course, is across all sort of link types DSL cable. By the way, we, you know, I could explain how we get the link types. It's kind of a sad story, to be honest. Part of it involved looking at over 2,000 websites for different ISPs and seeing which ones provided different link types and only filtering using the ones that only provide one link type to make sure that we're only looking at a particular link type. That was a huge pain. I'm really tired of seeing pictures of people laying on their bed with their computer. They have all this like default imagery they use on these websites. It's really annoying. Um, but anyway, with Hosed, interestingly enough, there isn't as clear a relationship as there is with, uh, with Down. And of course, with satellite links, in both scenarios, it actually turns out. Uh, this is, bless you, this is um, one of the large satellite ISPs in the US called uh, Wild Blue. It's one of the main ones that we were probing. And there's always interesting stuff happening in satellite, uh, especially when we get to temperature. 
This is pretty fun. So uh, here's an example. I'll go with satellite first because honestly, we kind of know, by the way, that satellite is affected by lots of different weather conditions. First of all, because it's really high frequency. I think wild blue is operating at 20 gigahertz or something so high frequency that rain fade and uh, fog and clouds and all these other weather conditions obviously affect it. But the temperature one was really weird. I looked at this and I was like, well, what the hell is happening? Um, yeah, and same for, for down and host. So here's the kind of crazy thing. This is my, uh, this is what I, my, again, explanation for the data, which of course you can come up with a million. I think this is likely to be sun outages. So one of the things about satellite internet connectivity or any satellite connectivity is that uh, at some points during the year, the sun will be sort of relatively in line with the bore side of the satellite. And of course, the sun is this giant electromagnetic emitter. So this is a well-known phenomenon. Satellite connectivity will have these known outages at a known point in the year. Uh, depending, of course, on what your location is, what size dish you're using, and where the satellite is located uh, on the horizon. So uh, my intuitive belief, so for Wild Bloom, where are their satellites deployed? And generally in the United States, the early fall and spring are when they have their sun outages. And so I believe essentially the fact that you're seeing 70 degrees here is kind of like you're seeing early fall and spring. Uh, whereas in the middle of the summer, you're unlikely to see a sun outage. So that's why the probability sort of drops off in the middle of the summer. Same thing for the winter. So I'm assuming this is during the day, right? So it's the same, all, same slots? This is all the time. Durations, or all time? Yeah, all the time. That's correct. Now, another cool thing to note here is that uh, let's look at X, which is the wireless internet service providers. For up to down failures, as the temperature increases, it's actually not so likely that the failure rate will increase. But for the host failures for these wireless ISPs, again, these are ISPs where you have these sort of fixed point-to-point -point wireless links between a uh, house uh, and a sort of central access point. These are used in rural areas and even now in many metropolitan areas. Uh, so we see this nice relationship with that weird host thing that I saw and temperature. As temperature increases, we get more and more in this host uh, behavior. It could be because these links are deployed outside. The equipment itself doesn't have air conditioning, can't handle heat. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but it certainly seems like there is a relationship there. Um, and the other cool thing is that at the extremes of temperatures, uh, we see that that's where this nonlinear sort of behavior, where for the other link types, at the extremely cold and the extremely hot are where you see uh, some effect, except for fiber. For up to down, up to down, and with fiber, it's kind of across the board. Uh, not doesn't seem that it's that affected by weather. Yeah, do you have a question? Uh, we have time. One minute. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Two more minutes. <laughs> Is there only two more minutes? Are there? Two more? Okay, I only have one more slide left. So, all right. So this is uh, now. Now we're looking not at continuous weather, where we're looking like at amount of rain, amount of heat. We're looking at different types of weather, and I call this the survivor experiment. Basically, the question is, at a particular hour for a particular host, when it was experiencing, let's say, a thunderstorm, what's the probability that it failed? Okay, and the error bars that you see here, I compute these probabilities, by the way, per day in our data set, and the error bars you see are 95% confidence intervals on the total set of days that we looked at. So how much per day is that probability of failing in each weather condition changing? So, uh, and by the way, you see on the top you see how many actual days that we have observed this weather for the different hosts. Uh, <laughs> there are some, like tornadoes, we barely see. There are only a few days where we see tornadoes, so that data is kind of funny, and that's why the error bars are gigantic. Um, so let's start out with the first thing. Uh, fiber and cable uh, generally have the lowest failure rate in clear weather. It's just kind of a simple basic observation that I was a little bit surprised by. It kind of makes sense in that the infrastructure is newer uh, and it is a wired infrastructure, but uh, that's where we stand there. Uh, that has nothing to do with weather, it's just a basic idea. Next, of course, satellite, as we had hoped, uh, has the highest difference between its failure rate in clear and its failure rate in rain. Again, that's expected because of rain phase. Uh, next, we see that uh, freezing rain, which is the dark purple line, actually has a pretty strong effect. I believe it's the dark purple line. 
Yeah, that's right. Uh, sorry? So this actually has a surprising effect for cable, where the error bars are nicely separated, as well as DSL. Um, but even for the other link types, it does appear that, to me at least, that freezing green affected more than I expected, which kind of, again, makes sense for up to down failures because freezing green is likely to freeze wires and then wires can snap. And so that, that seems not too surprising there. But, um, and generally also, thunderstorms are bad for every link type, even though we try to filter out the power outages using those really conservative measures of uh, power outage. Is it still likely there's some power outages in there? For sure. But again, it's a really, I was really surprised that we saw, by the way, before we did this filtering, I think we saw generally a four times uh, higher probability of failure in uh, thunderstorm compared to clear. And once we did the filtering, it went down for some of them by two or less times the probability. Why is there no tornado data for fiber or wisps? Which one? Fiber and wisp don't have tornado data. Uh, they have no tornado? There's no tornado at Yeah, yeah, so that means we've never we have that so far. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the tornado data is very sparse. There are only a few, like, sort of... The 2011 was really bad, and that, I think, is where you're seeing a lot of the satellite dial-up customers. That was in Oklahoma, I think, when all those tornadoes were. So finally, you know, this data set is also kind of interesting to observe other phenomena. Like, this is when Hurricane Sandy came uh, over to the East Coast. And uh, here you can see that, again, this is most likely power failures. This is the raw data itself. But as it enters over New Jersey, uh, the whole sort of New York metropolitan area goes out around the same time. Uh, and the thing is, like, we're one of the few folks that are observing these events. So we're just the ones that have the data, and we can answer a few questions on. By the way, I mean, it was a little tough to see maybe when it was crossing, but. Way off in Pennsylvania, they were losing uh, connectivity quite early on, even before the tornado hit the shore. And it looks like there might have been an ISP in the Washington, D.C. area that turned itself off somehow before the storm came. I'm not sure what the benefit of that would have been, but uh, it, it definitely, you'll, if I reverse it again, you'll see that it sort of turns off way earlier before the other one's done. And the last one's conclusion, so I can do that. Oh, we're a minute over, so I'll just conclude. Okay, so. Uh, generally, what we did here was observe weather and try to figure out how weather relates to failures of residential links. But in the end, that resulted in us making a tool to figure out what failures are, when failures occur in residential links and for a broad set of residential links. And I think this is applicable for more than weather. And I'd be definitely interested in hearing you guys' thoughts on what, what else do you think you could apply this data to. Also, you know, we found these interesting relationships between different weather conditions, some nonlinear stuff that I didn't expect, uh, as well as, you know, this interesting linear behavior for rain when uh, we go from up to down, but not a linear behavior for hose. And I, I believe that's actually not something that I showed in the data, that as the precipitation in inches increases, uh, you have a linear relationship for up to down failures, but not for hose. And finally, the link type definitely matters, even for our wired links. And this, again, intuitively seems like it could make sense. If DSL infrastructure is on older telephone lines, the cable infrastructure is newer. It, even though, you know, theoretically they're kind of similar uh, in that the way that they're deployed, they, it definitely affects the relationship between the, or, uh, the failures and whether or not. Finally, the host thing. And this is to clear up the point that you guys made in, in, earlier on. Here's what I think. Uh, what I've observed is that for most link types, uh, DSL, cable, satellite, fixed uh, wireless, they assume link budgets, meaning they set a fixed modulation rate and coding, and that's what's used throughout like the entire running of this network. And if the link type or if the link conditions change, then you just lose packets. And that's why, you know, when I ran my test at home, uh, I was using 256 QAM on my DOCSIS 3 cable modem, and as I increase the attenuation, I'm still using 256 QAM on my DOCSIS 3 cable modem, because that's how these networks are designed. They're designed assuming a link budget, that basically, at worst case, the signal probably degrade by X. And I think, you know, we have to start asking ourselves, maybe the observation of this host phenomena makes us wonder if those link budgets are First of all, if they're um, adequate, 
And second of all, if we should add rate adaptation to our protocols, and it turns out Doxus 3.1 is adding it. And I think a bunch of these protocols within the next few years will also add it. So this issue of host, I'd like to see on the long term if it starts going away. My expectation is that it actually might. Um, and, but again, I was super surprised. Intuitively, as a wireless guy, I'm like, when I turn down the signal quality, the rate should drop. Well, it's, and, yeah, well, it's true for wireless. In, in general, that most of the, your phones and you know, base stations access points, etc. will, will do that. Exactly, and that's where my intuition came from. But when I, I'm looking at this link, a coaxial cable link is essentially a wireless link on a cable. It's not doing much different than that. And sure enough, they don't change it. And I think, I've talked to a few people about this. They claim it comes from the sort of broadcast mentality of these providers, especially the cable ones, which is just, you know, yeah, when we send our TV signal to everyone's house, we don't send it at different rates, we send it at one rate. And, you know, they get a better antenna if they want to fix it. <laughs> you should put an inline amplifier if, you know, you're having a link budget issue. So, okay, that is the conclusion of my talk. Any questions? Oh, I wanted to end, by the way, with this quote, which I think is kind of telling. Uh, one of the questions that often comes up with this is, why not just underground all the cables in the United States, and how much would that save our lives? And the fact is, like, budget-wise, the way the United States, the size, where people live, it's incredibly expensive to underground, and in fact, just completely prohibitively expensive. For new communities, you can do it, but for old communities, the cost is insane. You know, six times the cost of the actual infrastructure right now, 25 years of deploy. This was really... <laughs> I mean, that's, that's not that much money if you're like Apple and has to have, have you know, <laughs> billions of dollars in the bank. Or, you know, I mean, large company like Apple or Google, 40 billion billion, they can put it in there, right? 95 years. They could, this is 25 years, years <laughs> but this is just in one community in North Carolina. It's $41 billion for North Carolina. Oh, this is in for the U.S. I was like, yeah, oh, that, seems, yeah. that seems small, we should just do it. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's $41 billion for one community in North Carolina, yeah. which is like... And it's, all, it's all right of way, right? It's, it's all right of way. Right of way is yeah. the biggest killer for undergrad. Yeah. Uh, question on the data. Uh, was there some element of predictability? Where we could predict an outage or something? Yeah. That's... Yeah. So I think we can. And, you know, from these probabilities that we observe, that we see somewhat consistently that the probability of failure in rain for DSL is X. And it, by the way, if we look more carefully and look per location, we might even have better guesses at what the probability is. So my, I think we do have the ability to predict. Now the question is, what do we do with that? And, and there's, to me, you know, for content distribution networks, there might be something. For peer-to-peer -peer networks, there might be something. But again, I, I'd be interested in your guys' feedback of what you think you could do you know, we, we can predict the weather, so weather is going to, rain is going to come. What is, what do we do to prepare for that in our last mile links? Do we you know, make sure that services that are peer-to-peer -peer that are running on those links get moved to some other links? Skype removes its, you know, uh, super hubs, whatever they're called, from links that are about to get rained on? I don't know. Yeah. So, I see the two ways you could possibly, so I'm really, I'm kind of interested in your edge detection, you know, host model. Sure. So there, there are a couple of uh, obvious approaches that you might be able to validate this model. One would be yeah. one would be sort of uh, versus ground truth. You yeah. actually you know have some validated data that you that you've measured it and said, well, actually, yeah, we, we went to the cables, we looked at it, and it was in fact water seepage. One hundred percent. And so, and the other would be sort of a mathematical model. And I guess my question for you is, like, what approaches you know did you take, or do you, or are you thinking of taking? for validating your model? So for the cable one, in terms of water getting in the cable, I actually am setting up the experiment now to inject water into cables and see what happens, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun, and hopefully I don't kill gas in the process. I mean, I, I'll try to figure out how to isolate myself as much as possible, but... Um, <laughs> so you're going to do experiments oh, to yeah, try yeah. to get that ground truth and yeah. then validate your model. A hundred percent. And but I'll tell you that you know I've already done a few experiments with attenuators where I'm trying to simulate some kind of attenuation. Basically, when water gets in your cable, it's not actually attenuation that happens. It's an increase in the standing wave ratio because the impedance of the cable changes. So it's not exactly attenuation. So I can try, and I've done with these variable attenuators. I've modeled it, and sure enough, you get this behavior. Latency doesn't really change, and losses loss rate increases. Um, but the question is, is it the same with water? I'm not sure. I need to run more experiments with actually injecting water into the study. Have you approached any ISPs for this study? Uh, okay. Yeah, so. Have they come to you? Maybe another way of getting ground truth, possibly. Yeah, so this it's is. It's dangerous, right? So I love 
I love to work with ISPs. I know that ISPs will never let me release any aspect of their data to anyone, and to me, that's my killer. So, and I mean, you, you say, what would you do with the data? For me, with an ISP background, I look at that and go, I can't magically make that part of the access network better. Sure. But what I can do is I can put a hijack in the IVR to say, we're aware of weather issues in your area. Yeah. Uh, we know about it. Uh, stay on the line if you'd like to talk to us or hang up. Because the spike of calls you get us as weather events come through, Probably you know, I've seen that data and they, they correlate really strongly. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and I, I mean, um, you know, one thing we can do is provide this as the public service to say, like, guys, don't call your ISP. The source is the weather. You know, if you want to solve this problem, you've got to figure out how to get better cables to your home, essentially. But um, that, would be, that would be my approach to, uh, to, to what to do with it. But you're right. I mean, uh, Collaborating with it, again, I, I don't know about collaborating. What ISP do you work for, can you say? Yeah, you know, I worked for one in Australia. Uh, I worked for a company that service, service, two companies that service service providers here, the big guys. And I'm now working for a company that does equipment for a wireless ISP. So what, what is that for a wireless? OK, yeah. cool. What, what is the chances that any of them would release their data? They're pretty guarded on it. Yeah, um, exactly. But I mean, let's, let's talk after. Because I think it's only from a wireless ISP perspective, I could probably I may, you know, Wireless ISPs are smaller. They're more likely to be open. at and it'd be, it'd be very tough. You know, for oh, the WISPs, for sure. I've actually already started collaborating with them to validate this data. Because they're just people that work at farms or wherever. And they're like, yeah, I put an access point in my you know, grain silo. I don't care if you get my data. But, you know, I, as a scientist, you know, I'm interested again in, in your guys' thoughts. You know, what if we use data that we can't have other people validate our results with? I, I, I'm, I'm just saying, as a scientist, I kind of don't trust myself to do it totally 100% right and, you know, then say, oh, yeah, this is it. Like, because I, I know that we make mistakes for humans. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so you have this. Uh, this picture at the beginning with the CMTS and then you're going to, to the different aggregation levels. And I'm wondering whether you did any any study where you could see uh, what piece of the equipment fails. Because let's say that you have a, a, a small area and you know who is at the same neighborhood, how these things are aggregated, see whether these are correlated on a specific point. Yeah, I mean, again, a controlled study where we have more data, uh, I haven't done it yet, but I, I want to figure out how to do it. But I think that has an even higher barrier than collecting. Use trace route. What was that? Using trace route. Yes. Oh, my, my, my question is uh, if I watch closely enough to, to see whether you actually made any comparison between uh, media that are strung up on poles and those that are underground, because you compare coaxial cable and fiber, sure. but not that it's uh, underground. Yeah, I mean, the. What we've started doing is comparing to Europe, where we're comparing the same media types to deployments in Europe. And generally, in Europe, actually, things are undergrounded. And preliminary results indicate that you still have similar relationships. So, But that's how we would do that study, because it's very difficult for us to get ground truth on what's undergrounded and what's not, except for to go and say, you know, Europe, generally, things are undergrounded. But it seems like wind would not affect underground stuff as much. Right? Yeah, so wind should not, you're right. Um, and I'm talking more on rain and the precipitation type behavior. Uh, it turns out that, you know, because these things are underground, a lot of them are air conditioned cabinets. There's still a lot of reasons for, you know, water could pool or whatever. Okay, let's Yeah. Because basically what you're comparing is whether other crash cables on poles break more readily than, than, than fiber cables, right? Not yeah. the right? not the intensity. Uh, well, that is an intrinsic quality of the mini mic, right? That's the point. Uh, but I, I mean, at the same time, um, we may ask ourselves, for instance, if we deploy fiber, is that the end of these problems? And at least for something like wind, it doesn't seem like that's likely to be the case. But for other precipitation, you know, for different types of weather, it actually seems like, you know, again, fiber has the lowest failure rates out of all of them across the board. So we may actually be. Uh, Improving by deploying fiber. Also, the distance may play a role, right? Distance between uh, RCP and. For sure, but again, that's why again each deployment is different. So I wanted to look at you know deployments across the board to get some kind of. You know. So I may have misunderstood the way you presented some of your data. But, sure. Um, for instance, when you did uh, the graph of wind speed versus yeah. uh, outages. Um, did you make any attempt to, for instance, just isolate that to wind speed? So for instance, I could imagine that increased wind speed would be really uh, cor well correlated with rainstorms, which mm -hmm. would be bad effect. 
Um, so, like isolating a particular yeah. uh, effect versus the other effects that were going on at the same mm -hmm. time. Yeah, I believe for the, um, I, I gotta remember correctly, for the wind speed, for all the uh, continuous variables, we made sure that that was the only effect going on at the time. Because you're right, I mean, a thunderstorm could be highly correlated with. Yeah, there's nothing we're talking about this. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, I mean, that, you're right, I mean, that is a source of it. And, and I, again, I, uh, I will, I, I could double check and contact you to make sure that that's correct. But uh, as far as I remember, we were isolating those two. Because for sure, it, it could be, uh, it could be a sort of mixing of variables. But even temperature in the summer, maybe there are more rainstorms or something like that. For sure. But, but again, I think um, because another thing to take into account, let's say that that wasn't actually what was done in this, is that when we look at the relationship between rain and failure rate and the relationship between you know, heat and failure rate, and they look different, Intuitively, to me, that implies that you know they're not necessarily uh, related. In that case. Something that I thought should have been related, but the data didn't show it at all, okay. was uh, sort of failure of DSL and dial-up because they share the same. Oh, you know, that's what I was going to ask. They share the same copper wire infrastructure. In fact, they're kind of the same. Like you know, if you're too far from the central office, you can just use dial-up. If you're close enough, you can use DSL, or you know, or if you're cheap, you get dial up on the same. Right, so I, I would give my here's my hypothesis on this one that basically they don't, the, have, dial <laughs> they don't have DSL when they have dial up, and so right. essentially, you know, if you have a D slam deployed in your neighborhood in an area where you have, or even a D slam of the provider in an area where you know they have that kind of coverage, the dial up providers that are on there from those websites I looked at are all really remote areas. Yes. Uh, so they aren't the typical dial-up. So basically what I'm claiming is that the copper is either probably older or deployed differently in those areas where people are still using dial-up, especially because I isolated only providers that only serve dial-up, and generally that's, aside from the bigger ones, which I actually don't include in this data, the smaller local ones where it's like your friend that has a modem bank, uh, then those are actually in really rural areas. So I think it would be different what copper is deployed there, how old it is. So, so yeah, it's Palo Alto should be the same. <laughs> what, what was that? In Palo Alto should be the same. In Palo Alto it should be the same, but I, I don't um, I don't have any dial-up providers that are Palo Alto. Dialogue. How many dial-up users would they be in Palo Alto? Yeah, <laughs> that'd be <laughs> awesome. They're probably a lot. They'd be, they'd they'd be not. I'd be very surprised. I think unless you're talking um, machines like ATMs and things like that with dial-up connection, yeah. I mean, there's I mean, no reason for a resident. I mean, I was surprised to find that, uh, well, I don't know, like, Net Zero still has like yeah. hundreds of thousands yeah. of, of dial-up customers. AOL still has customers. Too. Yeah. So, so expect also, also that if there is no dial-up, they don't have also a phone connection, right? Uh, wait, if they have dial-up, if they, they don't have a dial-up, yes, dial-up for instance, also maybe means also they don't have even a phone connection. Right? Sure, like the satellite folks definitely no, that's all they have. Dial-up, uh, if it's corporate. So if they don't have dial-up. Dial that well, they fact, also, they don't have a phone. That's probably the case, yes. Right. That, that's important also. Well, I'm, sure that that. That. I'm just curious. Because they, they cannot make a call. <laughs> oh, so you complain about it being broken? Yeah, because you talk about the remote location, maybe they don't have a you know, uh, cellular. Well, cellular, they could potentially have. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do one more yeah. question and then we'll sure. Yeah. Sure. I actually had two somewhat unrelated questions. Uh, yeah. One was just more of a comment about. It'd be interesting to correlate the failure rates of internet with also failure rates of things going over the same pipes, like phone or like cable. Yeah. Um, and again, how do you get access to that? It's going to be right? tough to do, though, yeah. now, because they are shared in so many instances. Like the triple play plans are kind of the ISP's new way of, or one of the ways of making a lot of money. So mm -hmm. a phone number doesn't necessarily mean you're going over a copper phone line. Right. You oh, but you're saying you want to correlate Cor for that correlate, reason. Yeah, yeah, for that reason. Ah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like yeah. that idea. That's a nice idea. Um, and the second point was sort of related to... Text. Except you have to call people, which could be a <laughs> problem. Right? Telemarketers did. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> Part of um, the second part was sort of related to bear arms, which was when you're collecting wind data, mm -hmm. uh, do you actually get NOAA forecasts for winds, or how do you how do you know when to start probing for wind? Uh, so there are these weather alerts that come out for high wind times, and that's mostly in coastal areas. It's for boating. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also, I'm not quite sure why they release them everywhere, but they do. I mean, it's well, just, one thing I was going to suggest is they do have winds law forecasts and area forecasts that do predict winds. For, for pilots, for pilots. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, and, and um, that, though, I'm not sure what the altitudes they're covering if it's too high for ground stuff. They'll, they'll go surface to uh, surface? Okay. 40,000. Yeah, that could be another input of data that I could use. Cool.